Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap, a game originally released back in 1989 for the Sega Master System. A classic that was not available to a Nintendo console. I'm going to talk about the original release along with three ports, two of them that were released in the 90s and then the modern 2017 enhanced remake. So let's get started. The original Master System release was treated as the third entry in the series. In fact, the game starts right off at the end of Wonder Boy in Monster Land, where the hero has to defeat Mecha Dragon. This approach to storytelling was later used in a more popular game, Castlevania Symphony of the Night, where the first act takes place on the final level of Wonder of Blood. This entry is notable for being the first to not get an arcade release. This is because it was designed to encourage multiple cities. To make this possible, the team added password saves which the player had to write down after talking to a purple pig inside the church. While it did not support battery saves, the password saves were not too long and even had a hard-coded password which allowed players to use powerful gear and play as human form after the prologue sequence. Despite being released in the late 80s, there's a good amount of secret rooms to discover and they are very rewarding to the player as some contain a lot of gold, magic ammo or even revival potions. Performance wise, it runs at 30 frames per second and is the only Master System Wonder Boy game to perform at a lower frame rate. At least it does support FM audio, here's an example. This version introduced some pretty well-known easter eggs, including producing golden blocks anywhere, Tasmanian sword to change forms, and boss door shortcuts after obtaining a maximum of 99 charm stones. Oh, and there's this one glitch which prevents the player from getting their game over by equipping Hades armor. It's a special armor which allows a single full revival, but it turns out it only goes away for good if you go to the armor select menu after using Hades revival. The physical Master System cartridge was never released in Japan because the system itself had tough competition against Nintendo's Famicom and Sega of Japan was focusing on the new release Mega Drive. The original version had two re-releases so far, Wii's Virtual Console and PlayStation 2's Sega 80's 2500 Collection Volume 29. Both of these re-releases support FM audio, but the Wii's Virtual Console version is better for speedrunning the game, whilst the PlayStation 2's re-release supports better video quality. A few years after the Wii Stone release, they allowed Hudson to port and publish the game to the PC Engine, provided they made no references to the Wonder Boy series. That version was called The Dragon's Curse, or Adventure Island in Japan. No, not that Adventure Island! Released in April 1991, it had a few minor visual alterations. For starters, Human's design no longer has green hair and now closely resembles the original Dragon's Trap concept art. Lizardman's skin colour was changed from green to brown. Piranha Man lost his body armour. Lastly, Lion Man became Tiger Man and now wears a cape. With the exception to Mecha Dragon, all boss rooms in the game no longer have a plain black background. One way Hudson did to avoid making references to Wonder Boy was to rewrite the entire script. 
Hudson added an extra feature to the game, the ability to support battery saves in addition to password saves. The game itself has 4 save slots, and if players wanted to make a 5th save, they can just jot down their password before turning off the system and carry on playing it later. Sadly, because this version is not a traditional Wiston entry, the Dragon Curse passwords are unique and not compatible with the Dragon Traps games, and some of the easter eggs are missing including Tasmanian sword transformations and boss door shortcuts after obtaining 99 charm stones. When it comes to performance, there's a big improvement over the Master System version as it runs at a slightly wider pixel resolution and doubling the frame rate from 30 to 60 frames per second. The Dragon's Curse only had one official re-release so far, Wii's Virtual Console. Unfortunately, the early TurboGrafx releases for the Wii used an emulator which runs at 480i, which causes a blur as you can see here. TurboGrafx games that were released much later for the Wii such as Castlevania Wonder of Blood used a newer emulator which runs at a cleaner 240p. A year after Hudson's Dragon's Curse, another port was released, this time on Sega Game Gear. This port was done by Wiistone and it was the first time Japanese players got their hands on a non-Hudson version. Because of this, the Japanese language was added to the game. Now you can see that the resolution runs at a much lower 160 by 144 pixels, and the engine never supported vertical scrolling. This led to tweaking the level design of every single room in the entire game. There were 4 notable map changes I've noticed when playing this version. A 4 block tall wall was added when going to the right after entering the desert and now requires Piranha Man to enter the canyon. This is done by going 2 screens to the left, fall down into a pit, then go 2 screens to the right underwater to find an exit and enter the canyon. The desert key used to enter the pyramid was moved to a different location inside Sphinx. Inside the sewers, there are two breakable blocks below the player which only Lyman can break as it leads to the correct path and enters the underground segment. The last one is notable for speedrunners. The key location in the jungle was moved to a higher location where only Mouseman can get the key thanks to mouse blocks and a fast falling spark. Getting the key in the jungle as Piranha Man is important because without it, it's not possible to enter the castle after executing the flying piranha glitch. Visual tweaks were really minor as one of the more notable changes involved replacing three NPC characters with brand new ones. They do look a lot like your typical anime characters in my opinion. Due to a lower resolution, some gear had to be renamed to shorter words such as Muramasa Sword to Ninja Blade and Tasmanian Sword to Kashmir Sword. Easter eggs were restored, including transforming into different animal forms anywhere, now with two alterations. Firstly, it no longer requires a second controller. Secondly, it can only change forms to animal species you unlocked permanently. Because of this, it's not possible to transform to Hawkman before Captain Dragon, or play a human post-introduction this way. Only a hard-coded password can be used to play as human outside of the castle. Crabs now have been altered slightly by taking a few steps backwards away from the player. Two major changes were made to the charm stones. The charm point stat was removed completely, allowing players to buy any gear they want without restrictions, and the charm stones were replaced with warp stones, and it allowed players to walk back to the village at any time. This was added as a way for a player to jot down a password before the system ran out of battery power. The majority of weapons and armor were a lot cheaper to buy, with Dragon Mail being an exception, as it had a price hike and Legendary Shield can be obtained for free by defeating a Blue Shadow Man inside the castle. Game Gear's Dragon's Trap only had one official re-release so far. PlayStation 2 Sega Ages 2500 Collection Volume 29. 
This re-release is ideal because you no longer need to worry about your batteries draining super fast. 25 years after the release on Game Gear, the Dragon Slayer made its return once more, and a significant one too. Announced on June 2016, a trailer was posted to YouTube showing a new hand-drawn art direction style as opposed to detailed pixel sprites. This version was released on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, PC, and Mac very soon after. One of the primary goals the team set for themselves was to make a game that is faithful and respectful to the original in terms of gameplay. Any additional tweaks that were made to the game were done without dumbing down the experience. Previous versions in the past, for example, supported three separate buttons, including jumping, attacking, and pausing the game. But Lizard Cube's release supported six action-related buttons and two presentation buttons. Changing magic can now be done by pushing a shoulder button. Casting magic only requires pushing a single button. Buy new gear gets equipped automatically. And hard containers can be attained in any order. It's now possible to change both equipment and magic inside a boss room. Mouse blocks had a huge overhaul, allowing diagonal inputs to go around a block as soon as possible, and sword stabbing whilst clinging to mouse blocks no longer halts movement speed. The charm point stat was removed yet again, but the stones are not gone for good. Charm stones now only appear as side quest items, and getting a certain amount allows the player to buy a brand new Gallic sword for exactly 2017 gold, and finding all six allows the player to use boss door shortcuts. Players can only find these charm stones inside six brand new challenge dungeons, the unknown. Each challenge is locked to a certain form and completing the challenge rewards the player with a charm stone. When it comes to visuals, it is presented with a higher resolution of 1080p. The game can now be played in widescreen mode. Adding widescreen support to a 4x3 game can make a huge difference to enemy AI that will only function properly once they appear on the screen. Because of this higher resolution, strategies in certain rooms will have to be adjusted slightly different this time round. Artwork designs have evolved from 8-bit sprites to hand-drawn animations, and they are very well made as most of the actions in the original used roughly 2 frames, but the new style used roughly 6 to 10 frames. There's another game that did this approach in the past, nearly 10 years ago. Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo HD Remix. This version of the Street Fighter 2 series introduced HD designs that were done by Udon Comics, but unlike Lizard Cube's work, they only remade the existing frames from the Pixel version, no brand new frames. In their defense though, the average sprite count for Street Fighter 2 is a lot higher than Dragon's Trap. One oddity I've noticed with this new animated approach, and that's mirror designs. The Pixel artwork had two set of sprites, one for facing left, and one for facing right. In the remake, the right side is faithful, but the left side is actually a mirrored version of the right. Lizard Cube confirmed this on Twitter saying that animating new left side drawings would cost a lot of money to produce, which is fair enough, as many of us are very used to mirrored designs. This applies to new 2D video games that came out this decade. Audio for both sound effects and background music have evolved from 8-bit PSG to live recordings. The style of music varies depending on the area, as some of the remade tracks have more than one variant, most notably the dungeon theme which has a whopping 6. My personal favourite is the boss fight theme against Dragon Zombie. It's also possible to mix and match the visual type and audio type, so if you want an 8-bit pixels with modern music and retro sound effects, that is possible. The Lizard Cube version tweaked the level design in some of the areas. For example, just before fighting against Mecha Dragon, there's a giant bat guarding the door. 
The maze before fighting against Mummy Dragon was suggested to be a tad longer to navigate. And the long corridor before getting Legendary Sword now has Yellow Fairy Zombies. That's right, yellow is a new colour in this release and they are more threatening than blue. For replay value content, there's a neat bonus for completing the game and it also offers a few extra difficulty settings. Easy difficulty reduces the number of hits required to kill an enemy. Hard raises the difficulty by increasing the number of hits required to kill an enemy. And a new mechanic has been added to the game, the Hourglass Timer. It functions very similar to its prequel and encourages the player to never stop moving. Hard pickups and entering certain areas in the game will either freeze and or restart the hourglass, so it's not as brutal as it sounds. Oh, and some rooms on hard have added some extra enemies. One last thing to mention is the ability to play as a female human protagonist at the very start of the game, Wonder Girl. The only real difference is using a new set of human frames for both 8-bit pixels and hand-drawn artwork. And so that's all four versions of Wonder Boy The Dragon's Trap. Which version is the best to play today? Well, all four versions are good games, but the best version to play today is easily the 2017 remake. It wins the reward for the best remake treatment in both visuals and audio, and tweaks some of the parts of the game that age badly, including item menu to change gear, and a single button input to cast magic. Master System is still unique for being the absolute original, and without that game, the Lizard Cube remake wouldn't exist. Game Gear takes third place because it feels very different to the other versions due to the combination of low design changes and annoying enemy spawns thanks to the smaller resolution. But the lower prices to purchase equipment and replacing charm stones with warp stones made this release a very interesting experience. Give this one a shot if you have a chance. Turbo Graphics is the weakest in my opinion because I dislike the fact that it lacks certain easter eggs, uses its own password system, and the most accessible way to play the game legally runs at 4ti and not 240p. There you have it, the end of the first episode of Port Talk. I hope you enjoyed my take on the Dragon Traps documentary and found something new and interesting within, and thank you very much for watching this introduction episode. If you did enjoy watching this video, feel free to hit a like button, subscribe and follow me on Twitter. Until next time folks!